Monday, everyone. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch, Case Cracked. Of course, Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what is the critical piece or pieces that help solve that mystery. We've got a real interesting one for you today. This is one that we like to call a motiveless murder. In 2013, Valerie Graves, a 55-year-old grandmother and a 10-year resident of Roxburghshire, Scotland, decided to move to the village of Bosom in Bracklesham Bay, West Sussex, to live with and care for her 87-year-old mother, Eileen. A loving friend and artist, Valerie had lived happily for many years in the area where she owned a gallery and craft studio. The move would force her to sell her beloved business, but it would also allow her to spend time with her mother and other family members that lived in the area. Not long after moving in, the winter holidays hit and so did Valerie's birthday of December 25th. Over the Christmas holiday, Valerie, her sister Janet, along with her boyfriend Nigel and their mother Eileen, decided to help a nearby friend while they celebrated. A couple on nearby Smuggler's Lane was spending the holidays abroad, and Valerie's sister and her boyfriend agreed to house-sit for them. On the 29th, several friends and family members visited the house and enjoyed both the Christmas celebrations and Valerie's 55th birthday. That night, the party broke up early in the evening at about 10 p.m. Shortly after, Valerie waved goodnight to her family, saying she was going to bed with a good book and her iPad. At mid-morning the next day, Janet had begun to wonder why her sister had not come down for breakfast. When she went to Valerie's room, she found her lying in bed with blood on the pillows around her head. She could tell that the woman's face had suffered extensive injuries. In a panic, she tried to wake her, but when she got no response, she quickly called 999 for an ambulance. Unfortunately, when paramedics arrived, Valerie could not be resuscitated and was pronounced dead at the scene. Residents were in shock as officers taped off the property and began the painstaking process of collecting evidence. When questioned, her family had no idea what had happened and had heard nothing strange the night before. Valerie had no enemies. As police began investigating the premises, they found that the patio door that led directly into Valerie's room was unlocked. This gave the perpetrator easy access to her and the house. In that room only, investigators found DNA evidence on the handle of the bedroom door and on Valerie's hands as well. When little else was found at the scene, investigators shifted their focus. In the days after her murder, officers spent a significant amount of time in the area speaking to not just local residents, but to people who commuted in from other towns to work. As they combed the area, about a fourth of a mile away, a claw hammer was found on nearby Ho Lane at the entrance to the driveway of the Hart's farm. Testing would confirm that claw hammer was the murder weapon. An autopsy found that just after midnight, Valerie had suffered fatal head and facial injuries with the claw hammer officers had found. The injuries were so significant that they bore similarities to injuries a person would suffer in a fatal car accident. There were no signs of a struggle, which showed that the perpetrator was either known to her or, more likely, snuck through the patio door silently and attacked her as she slept. Four days after the murder, on January 14th, 2014, her son Tim and her daughter Jemima appeared at a press conference to appeal for any information in their mother's case. Even though a local man was soon arrested and questioned, he was quickly cleared, bailed out, and released. A week later, investigators began working with BBC TV's Crime Watch, hoping to provide a more complete picture of events to jog the public's memory. From then until April, investigators worked to produce a complete reconstruction of the night of the murder. When the show aired, it featured the reconstruction, interviews with Valerie's family, along with a fresh appeal to the public, and announced a reward of £20,000. This kicked off the largest forensic investigation Sussex police had ever conducted. In the months that followed, while investigators handled detailed forensic work, officers held street briefings with local residents to assure them about the investigation and to continue to ask for any information they may have. Determined to keep their mother's death at the forefront of people's minds, at the one-year anniversary, Valerie's family handed out new posters and talked with residents. That evening, the whole family appeared before local and national media yet again at a press conference to make a fresh appeal. 
they remained steadfast in their belief that the killer would be caught, but lamented the fact that they would find no closure until then. Finally, in November of 2014, investigators were given a small break. Forensic experts were able to gather a limited DNA profile of their suspect from both the hammer and the evidence left at the scene. When no match was found in law enforcement databases, investigators decided to request voluntary DNA samples and a thumbprint from all men over 17 years of age who lived or worked in the area. By January of 2015, more than 9,500 people had been interviewed and 600 statements had been taken. Officers knocked on more than 700 doors and DNA tested almost 3,000 locals. No matches were found. With this disappointment, the investigation seemed to lose steam and slowly grow cold. Even though the family made fresh appeals every year at the anniversary of their mother's death, no new information came to light. Then in September of 2018, Sussex police received information from Romania, suggesting that a man named Christian Sabu was responsible for Valerie's murder. Investigators learned that in 2013, Sabu had lived in a mobile home on a scrapyard industrial site near the Chichester area. While there, he and a friend worked odd jobs for the people on Smuggler's Lane. He had even previously been to the house that Valerie and her family would house sit months later. Suddenly, just two weeks after the murder, he left the area. In 2018, Sabu's wife found her husband looking at pictures of the hammer used in Valerie's murder on a news site covering the case. She knew that this was the same hammer that he had used while working at the scrapyard. When she confronted her husband with her suspicions, he became agitated before eventually admitting that he was responsible. Almost a year later, investigators were finally able to secure a European investigation order that would allow them to obtain DNA samples from Sabu in Romania. Those tests revealed that he was a match. On July 10th, 2019, Sabu was arrested at his home in Dej, Romania. As he was led away by officers, he could be heard saying, I tell you honestly, I did not mean to hurt her. Nine days later, he was extradited to the UK and on July 20th was charged with the murder of Valerie Graves. Further investigation revealed that on the night of the murder, Sabu, armed with a hammer, rode his bicycle to the house on Smuggler's Lane. He had been told that the owners were gone for the holidays and had a safe in the house that contained a large amount of cash and gold. As he walked in through the unlocked patio door where Valerie was sleeping, he saw her and panicked striking her repeatedly with the hammer until she was dead. He then fled the scene, throwing the hammer away on Ho Lane as he rode by. Although Sabu readily admitted his guilt, he maintained that he did not go to the house to kill or harm anyone. He only intended to carry out a burglary. He claims that what happened that night will haunt him forever. In court, he testified that, quote, She woke up. I panicked. I was 21. I was very young and immature. I never meant to kill anybody. On November 11th, 2019, Christian Sabu pleaded guilty to the murder of Valerie Graves. At his sentencing hearing, the presiding judge gave her views on the murder. It was your dishonesty which led you to carry out the burglary, and it was your lack of conscience which led you to kill Valerie. I accept that you did not go there to kill or harm. Your motivation was greed. She then sentenced Sabu to life in prison with a minimum term of 24 years. After sentencing, her family addressed Sabu and the court and told of the years of heartache they had endured. You took away our mom, who was also a sister, daughter, gran, and friend to many, a life of someone who can never be replaced. We hope that while he is serving his sentence, he will reflect on the actions he took and what this has done to our family. Sadly, Valerie's mother passed away, never knowing that her daughter's killer had been found. After sentencing, senior investigating officer, Detective Chief Inspector John Fanner addressed reporters and talked about the mass DNA screening that the department had endured, the complexities of the case, and the sheer number of interviews carried out. He didn't feel any better about Sabu's admission of guilt without motive than the family did. Quote, Although Sabu admitted killing Valerie, it was only when he was finally arrested over five years later. I hope Valerie's family will be able to find some peace knowing that her killer is finally behind bars. 
case cracked. We would like to thank the Daily Mail, the Mirror, the Argus.co.uk, the Independent, UK News, Yahoo, BBC.com, and Wikipedia. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's story. What a senseless crime. It's just, it's mind blowing. And the thing that really bothers me about it is they didn't see any defensive wounds. So him getting freaked out, what exactly was that about? Because it seems like she was probably asleep when he entered the room. He just saw someone and then got freaked out and attacked her before she woke up. I, I still don't know if I really believe that part of the story. Uh, something that I've heard from experts several times is that many murders are actually other crimes that have gone terribly wrong. And sometimes those crimes are as simple as a robbery. And maybe that's what's going on here. Uh, obviously, there was no connection between the two people, so there can't really have been any type of motivation on a personal front or anything like that. But yeah, just a terrible, terrible story. Uh, a bit of a dark side effect to all this is the investigation named a person. A man named Daniel Pereira was originally detained for the murder. He said that he believes he was taken into custody because he lived close to the murder scene and police needed a suspect. He was held for three days, interrogated for 10 hours, and finally released on bond. He says that because of the publicity, he lost his home, his job, and was even admitted to a psychiatric ward. Although he has moved on, he has a child with his partner, he states that he still left broken and he takes anti-anxiety meds and sleeping pills three times a day. For months, he was unable to sleep from having nightmares and lived under the constant fear that he would be killed next because he was linked with the crime. Today, he just wants his name cleared, so he's no longer associated with the crime, so I wanted to be sure to include Daniel's story as a reminder that homicide investigations can be life-altering experiences for everyone involved in them, sometimes if you're not even involved in the crime in any way at all. Thank you to PayPal supporter Amanda Beard. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit www.lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, or buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, learning about justice, how to keep ourselves and our families safe, and of course, spending time with you. I'll be back on Wednesday with a new episode of Searchlight, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.